A core function is to make laws for the country and represent the interests of their constituents. But that has expanded into other areas such as attending funerals, paying medical and school fees, and many others. However, some members of parliament say this additional workload is taking a toll on them financially and health-wise, with some saying that the job is becoming increasingly stressful. Some weeks ago, there was a discussion on the floor on parliament about how MPs can maintain a better quality of life during their tenure and after they finish serving. Zuleha Nuhu has more in this report read to you. And Mr. Speaker, at the time, Professor Michael Quay, as chair of the board, needed to help a former MP with 12,000 Ghana cities. And this MP was requesting to do a surgery, prostate, a prostate surgery. I want to keep the name because... It's a typical day in Parliament, where members of Parliament passionately debate matters concerning their constituents. However, today's focus shifts inward as concerns about the health of MPs take center stage. Tamale South MP and former minority leader Haruna Idrisu had raised concerns on the floor of the House about the quality of health of former members of parliament and incumbent members of parliament. The Honorable Muntake is saying, I know we've tried at the board that even the medical facility in parliament should be made open and free to former members of parliament. Asawase MP Muntaka Mubarak emphasized the agent's need to address the health challenges encountered by members of parliament both during and after their terms of service. Outside the parliamentary chamber, MPs reflect on the toll their work takes on their well-being. In Shiaesu MP, Stephen Amwa means no words as he said the work is stressful. Honestly speaking, I think the, the word stress is even an understatement. It's extremely stressful, extremely, very, very stressful. And it's stressful because of what it entails. The work is extremely cumbersome because you need to work here. You need to attend to your constituents and then even <laughs> Ghana at large. And now they are shifting almost everything about the country to MP. So I think even it moves beyond the core functions of a parliamentarian. If somebody has any issue, being social, being developmental, being economical, being financial, they call the MP. So it's getting too tedious. Because I was talking to uh, a couple of my colleague MPs, and I was telling them that at least every year they should check like twice. Because I was trying to recommend um, a particular um, doctor, specialist to them. But I think the issue about stress it's very, very important. It has to be an integral part of whatever we are doing here. And it's good that uh, you guys have started this. It's very, very important. You've done well. I think you're on point. Because I think most of us here don't really have time for our health. That is what I think. Usiga MP Ladi Ayamba highlighted that the health and financial stability of MPs are significantly impacted by their responsibilities. Very, very, very stressful. Very stressful. We have personal issues, we have community issues, we have religious issues, we have constituency at large issues. You have people who will come to you about ill health and they come to you with all sincerity that you have to help them. You have nowhere to turn to. Nobody to give you. The unfortunate and the painful aspect is that people would rather tend to always be talking about common fund, MPs common fund, MPs common fund. This thing is supposed to be to come quarterly. So people come about health. People come about education. That is school fees. Others come about even marriage. Person wants to marry and comes to you as an MP that you should help or, or support that person, him or her, to marry. Both men and women, or boys and girls, they do. Bole Bamboy MP Yusif Sulemana echoed the same sentiments, indicating that the overwhelming responsibilities of MPs have a profound effect on their health. Let me admit that, indeed, my work is very stressful. 
you have three major uh, constituencies to look at. One, you want to serve the interests of your constituency. In that regard, whether the person is MPP, the person is NDC, that's not the issue. Your concern is how do you ensure that your people feel your impact, having selected you to come and represent them here. Then, of course, it is your party that brought you to parliament. So that's another constituency out of the larger constituency that you have to also give some special attention to. And it also, it also comes with this stress. Before you now come to the house, parliament here, a lot of things to read, a lot of things to learn. And sometimes for me, wherever I find myself in any uh, hospital facility, I try to take the basic, uh, uh, do the basic checks. And so you see me taking my blood pressure, you see me taking my temperature and all of that. But I try as much as possible to do twice in a year. And as I age, I think that I should be able to increase the number of times I've been uh, uh, do checkups. Executive Director of ASEPA, Dr. Rashid Rahman, says government's intervention is necessary to address the health challenges faced by incumbents and former MPs. Call Honorable Olu Aringo. He's, he's a known reformist uh, in Kenya. And he led the Parliamentary Service Commission in Kenya many years ago to go through a lot of reforms. And today, members of parliament in Kenya uh, are one of the best catered for parliamentarians in the world in terms of their financial kind of well-being. And I believe that that is the number one. I mean, if, if, uh, if you ask them as human beings, apart from being about, first of all, the pension or whatever end of service benefits that, that, uh, that, that they, they should, should be entitled to. If we take away the, that business of, I mean, collateralizing their pension against the vehicles that they use for their official work, I think that that would be a big first step. I think the second one, and this is my advice to former MPs, you know, in this country, uh, once, once an MP or once a politician, people always want to live at that level of lifestyle. Um, if you are a teacher and you go into parliament, tomorrow when you leave parliament, you should go back and do your teaching job. I mean, you have a profession. But most of them, once they leave parliament, they want to live the life of a politician. Apart from the fact that maybe financially they will be better off, I think even your state of mind, when you sit at home and you are not doing anything, it affects your health significantly. You know, the Speaker of Parliament was um, quoted as saying that when MPs leave Parliament, three years later they die. But the point she was making at the time, because she was somebody that we worked with very closely, was the fact that she was trying to bring um, something to Parliament that would help prepare members of Parliament, a program that would help prepare members of Parliament uh, for life after Parliament. So maybe give those who don't have proper careers, try to orient them, try to help them develop some careers and so on. Um, in our Parliament, we don't have anything like that. So things like that could help significantly so that, you know, uh, whilst you are there, you have four years. Some are lucky to get maybe eight years or more. Uh, if there are some kind of avenues, some mechanisms to prepare them for life after parliament, even psychologically, even getting uh, professional counsellors to come and speak to them about things that they can do after parliament, I think that that can, that can significantly help. Otherwise, I know, I know their conditions. Sometimes some of them cannot even afford fuel, I mean, for their vehicles. Because if you don't have a job, you don't have a pension, 